Good afternoon, and it is afternoon, believe me. Um, my name's Andy Young, I'm one of the lecturers down at Unitech in Auckland. I've just moved to our North Shore campus, back again, right. Um, we've been doing lots and lots of work on a 2013 Yamaha Viking. And the last video that was posted was about, oh, I don't know, a week, two weeks ago. And that covered um, a road test on the vehicle after we rebuilt the engine, put it back in the machine, just to sign it off. And we found that the coolant fan on the radiator um, was inoperative. Uh, a few quick checks um, using a test light, we found that the circuitry on the vehicle itself, the relay, the fuse, everything to do with providing the fan power was working just fine. Um, pulled the fan, we took the fan off, pulled the fan apart, and we found the fan motor full of water. It was junk, basically. Uh, the brushes, half the brushes were seized. Two of the two of the four brushes were seized up in the holders. Um, commutator was pretty badly corroded. The rearmost bearing um, was seized up as well. So that that fan wasn't going to go anywhere. Certainly couldn't go back out on the vehicle. So we ordered a new one through Yamaha, and four hundred and ten dollars later, the new fan turns up. Um, so today this video is going to be reinstalling the fan and doing a second road test and you can come with me on this road test uh, to sign the vehicle off because believe it or not we really need to get this vehicle back to its owner. He, he's in desperate need uh, to put it back to work. Um, unfortunately this fan has taken a couple of weeks to arrive from Yamaha. They're, they're on, they were on back order, probably are on back order again. They seem to be a common problem with these machines. Um, Realistically, I think the real problem is down to the fact that if the fan is submerged, talking to the customer and the kind of use he puts it to, um, they have a breather on them, a little breather down here, and that goes down. I'm going to put it on this particular vehicle as high up as I can on the body with a little U-bend at the top um, because he fords a lot of creeks and stuff, and if you do that with a breather down the bottom, like it's, it's standard fit, then you're going to get um, water going up the breather pipe and into the fan motor and believe me from what we've seen inside those fan motors they won't last five minutes full of water so let's go back to the vehicle it's parked outside we're going to jack it up take the front left wheel off and fingers crossed we can reinstall the fan in exactly the same way as i took the old one out uh, and that means we don't need to drain the coolant hopefully So we're just going to remove the shock first like we did last time to get access to the rad. Then we're going to undo the rad mounts and slide that radiator out to a certain point where we can get the new, uh, get the new radiator snicked in. Pretty sure the Yamaha manual says you've got to disconnect all the coolant hoses. But, uh, the whole system is full of brand new coolant. And it's bled up and they're a bit of a pain to bleed up these things. Not really want to have to drain all the coolant again. Seems we've got the old radiator out, we shouldn't need to do that. So I've undone the mounts at the top of the radiator just as before. I'm just going to bring the rad out, just being cautious of that, uh, that brake back down there. Look. That is it. Just going to bring the radiator out. Yay yeah, far, and we should be able to slot the fan in, bolt the fan onto the radiator once it's back in position. Righty ho. One new fan. Right. 
It's going to be a bit tricky, it always is. It was pretty tight getting the old one out, to be, all, to be honest with you. Bingo! It's going to get lined up with the, uh, with the red now. Bolts required. I think we'll get it in position first. And then we can there we go, perfect. Really important you align these dowels at the bottom of the radiator, otherwise it's not going to get the support that it needs. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so bolts back in on the cowl now. That was a really tight fit. Still, although it's a bit awkward, still better than some cars. And of course it saved draining a lot of coolant and then having to um see if the ones are shorter. Having to uh, re-bleed the system as well. That's a real pain on one of these. Basically the radiator is just fitted in exactly the same way, so the radiator fan is getting installed in the same way that the old one came out, just a reverse procedure. Yeah, it's a bit awkward, it's a bit tight in places. It's not too bad really. Could be a shed load worse. Don't over tighten those. Excellent. Okay. 
Now for the top mount. Okay, well the camera is pretty precarious, so if you end up on the floor, my apologies. Just gonna drop those two pins onto there, look. And again, pop these two bolts back in. Pretty rudimentary stuff to be honest. I was going to go flying. Okay, you're not forgetting to connect the horn. One. Doesn't matter which way around these go, because the horn's insulated as regards an earth anyway. Okay, so we've got the breather pipe coming up from the front diff, and all the breather pipes, they just finish this little cutout on the plastic, which means that they're as high as possible pretty much on the vehicle. That's going to minimise getting water, unless of course we've got too deep. Right, this is the breather coming up from the fan motor itself, and it's pretty short, it's not really long enough to be honest. I'm going to tuck it in there, and there's just enough to wedge it through there as well. But the last thing we want is that thing to drop down, so we're going to put a couple of cable ties on it just to make sure it doesn't, it doesn't actually go anywhere. Same on this side, we'll put one just forward of this bulkhead and that's going to really help to stop it from uh, getting dislodged. Obviously remember don't do the cable ties up too tight, we don't want to be blocking the pipe. Cool, get rid of that one more there. Tidy the place up a little bit. Okay, so just checking all the breather pipes. We've got the breather coming off the expansion bottle here, the reservoir, and that's already in position. That goes around the loop and down. We've got another one here, which is the one from the front diff. And the fan one is just still up there, the clear one. Now we need to find the, uh, the, the power wire for the fan, and we've got to connect it down here, look, onto this, this little plug here. fan wire which is going to have to go, it's pretty short, it's going to have to come through here on the frame and get connected back here now. Make sure we get the right around because there's it's a pretty important retaining system on that. There we go, and ah, that's connected. Excellent. I think I'd like a zip tie on that just to make sure it doesn't get in the way of the fan blades. I think we'll just put one off that, uh, that coolant pipe there, look. So we'll just put a, put a zip tie just around there. Just to make sure that, that that wiring doesn't end up going anywhere near the fan blades. Because that's not going to do it any good at all. Now again, this is a coolant pipe, we don't want to restrict the flow. Just a floating zip tie, we don't want it to be too tight, but I will cut the tail off again. There we go. So just off the by the radiator cap there is the overflow pipe 
that goes down to the uh, the coolant reservoir. Now, if the coolant system gets overpressurized, there's a release valve in this where this radiator cap works, where it fits. Built into the cap is a pressure relief valve. If you look at my um, coolant systems diagnostics video, you'll see how that works. So, if the system overpressurizes, that valve will lift and coolant under pressure, quite high pressure, will return down or head off down to the reservoir, the reservoir tank. Now, that's fine if the zip ties are a little bit tight on that pipe, the pressure will force the, the coolant through. The problem occurs is as the system cools down, the, uh, the volume of fluid contracts as it cools and a vacuum is created um, in, the, in the coolant system. A little valve opens here, the vacuum valve inside, and coolant is sucked back from the reservoir back into the radiator. That's how it works. If we over pressurize um, or over tighten these zip ties, then that's going to, the, the, the vacuum isn't sufficient to draw the, the, the coolant back into the reservoir. So you'll find that your radiator will always run low on its level of coolant and that could cause overheating. So if you're going to use zip ties on any kind of pipes that come from your radiator, just like this, make sure you don't over tighten them. They're there just to secure the pipe um, loosely. It mustn't be held too tight. You don't want to crush that pipe because that could cause it to, to nip shut like a valve uh, when the vacuum kicks in. Okay, so everything's in place now and we're just going to reinstall the shock. Now, whilst I've had the shock off the vehicle, the coil of a shock, I've had it lent against the wall in the upright position. That's always a good way to store the shocks. Right, that pops into there, that goes in there. And we need some bolts. Now again, we're gonna put some copper paste on these bolts. Just like pretty much every bolt we take out, we put copper paste on. Just makes it a lot easier next time round. Nuts to the rear. Excellent. Important you double check your wheel looks nice and tight. You may have noticed the windy gun was pretty slow earlier on. That's 
so I turn the air compressor off. In some workshops you never quite know if the air compressor's on or not. You might be around the back and you can't hear it. So you buzz them up, buzz them up with a windy gun. They're nowhere near tight. So you need to just always double check with a power bar, cracking bar, torque wrench, whatever you want. You don't want wheels, you don't want wheels coming off. Great stuff. Okay, so what you've not seen on camera is we replaced uh, the rear brake hose and bled the rear brake system up again. That was a previous task where we spotted, whilst doing the calipers, we spotted some damage on the rear brake hose, the flexi hose. That's the one that runs right across the back of the vehicle. So that's now been changed and we've bled the brakes up again. Didn't see any point in doing a video for that. I'm sure you know how to change your brake hose. And the final task we've now just finished, which was to replace the coolant fan on the radiator. Now, a previous video covers how to get that fan taken out. Yes, I did cheat. It was a bit difficult, but we pulled it off. Um, I really didn't want to take any coolant pipes off. Didn't want to drain the coolant out of the vehicle. Um, the radiator's at the front, the engine's at the back. There's some really long coolant pipes running all the way through the vehicle. There's a bleeder on the thermostat housing. They're not the easiest things to bleed up. Uh, it takes a while, it's quite time consuming. Uh, didn't really think that had to be done. I had a hunch I could get the cooling fan out without undoing any coolant pipes. It came out, I must admit, a bit easier than the new one going in. Don't know why that was, but it's quite often the case. Uh, Sod's law, I think, comes into it. But the new fan's in, the engine's cold. We know that the new fan's gonna get uh, a feed when the engine gets up to uh, a temperature where the thermistor trips and triggers the relay and the relay provides a current to the fan motor. Um, what we need to do now is a road test on the vehicle to get it up to operating temperature, to get it beyond operating temperature so that we can see the coolant fan cut in and actually work. That's really important. Remember this vehicle came in originally with an overheat problem. Could have been the thermostat, could have been the fan, could have been whatever. Uh, I know that the customers were constantly topping up the water, uh, but they wouldn't have been bleeding it as per the Yamaha process where you undo that bleed nipple or the bleed valve on the thermostat housing, which would have meant even though the radiator was full of water, there would have still been loads of air in the system, which would have caused hot spots around the head, which could easily have caused the head gasket failure. So there's many reasons uh, why the head got warped, or many possible reasons why the head got warped. So we have to do a road test. Now the vehicle's also come in for a full service. The full service has been done and the full brake service has been done as well. So we need to go and take the vehicle into an environment where it's going to, similar to what it's going to be used in to make sure that all the systems on the vehicle work correctly. This is the fun part. Here we go. Okay, so hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, we need to test all the functions on this particular vehicle. It's an off-road vehicle, so it's got part-time four-wheel drive. Uh, we want to check the cooling fan, we want to check the brakes, we want to check the handbrake. Basically, to make sure that the vehicle is in good working order for the customer. Now, don't get me wrong, this isn't a case of thrashing around the paddock like an idiot. Um, this is a, a specific road test um, for this kind of vehicle and we're going to be going up some quite steep bank sides and down and checking engine braking 
got to be checking if all your drive system works correctly, um, all that kind of stuff. Yes, it's great fun, but we do need to remember that this is a customer's vehicle and we need to respect that. Especially given the fact this is going to go on YouTube very shortly. Okay, here we go. So first of all, we're going to select high range and we're in two wheel drive. Now when we start to go up some pretty steep bank size, the rear wheels are going to spin and the front wheels should remain stationary and the vehicle will stop. And we'll take the handbrake off. Now, just while we're on the bank side, we're going down a steep hill now. If we put the handbrake on, it's neutral. Put the handbrake on, and that's holding us really well. That tells me that that handbrake adjustment that we did on one of the previous videos when we rebuilt the parking brake, that's working really well. Two or three clicks on the handbrake lever, and it's holding us on probably about a 30 degree slope. We'll try it again when we're pointing up the hill. Back into neutral. We're on about a 45 degree slope right now, and that, again the handbrake's holding us really well. So I'm very happy with that. It's great. Okay, so I'm going to put it into low box. Now we don't have four-wheel driving gauge. We're still in two-wheel drive. When I come to set off, I'm expecting the rear wheels to start to spin. vehicle wouldn't go up the hill. Now if we engage four-wheel drive, that should engage the front wheels drive and we should be able to go forwards. So the front wheels now are being driven, we've got four-wheel drive. So let's check the four-wheel drive system for us, just making sure that that solenoid on the front is working correctly. Stick it back into high. Now we do also have a diff lock. Let me explain to you what that means. Um, when the vehicle's in two-wheel drive, the drive is to the rear wheels. It's got an open diff at the back. When one of those two wheels spins, the vehicle becomes stationary. Put it in four-wheel drive, and then it becomes, uh, you've got drive to the front axle and to the rear axle. But if, and it's got a center, center diff. Now, if any of those four wheels start to spin, the vehicle becomes stationary. If we engage the diff lock, that's a center diff lock then means that one front wheel and one of the rear wheels needs to spin before the vehicle loses all its traction and becomes stationary. It's not an axle diff lock, so don't get confused. It's a center diff. So we can have it in four-wheel drive without the diff lock engaged, and one wheel spins and the vehicle's stationary. That's what should be happening. Right, a few more, a few more testing, I think. the diff lock engaged I can feel that the steering is really tight the vehicle just wants to go straight ahead it doesn't want to steer at all that's telling me there's a lot more drive going on when I change back to four-wheel drive uh, the steering becomes a lot easier to move which is telling me that basically the diff lock is working even though I haven't got a really muddy environment to test it uh, the diff lock is definitely working 
So we'll go back to normal four-wheel drive and the steering should free up again now. Okay, so we're just going down a, a steep gully now and she's still in high ratio two-wheel drive so I don't expect the vehicle to get through this at all. It does, it's all about the driver. Okay, just trying to deliberately get it to go. No, what a machine! Two-wheel drive. drive at the moment and I'm just going slightly across the bank side um, probably about 25 degrees across the bank side it's pretty steep and we've got uh, opposite corners spinning so now if I engage the diff lock that should give us additional traction to get to the top of the hill hopefully and that'll tell us it'll be category proof that the diff lock is definitely working Again, to disengage the diff lock, just into reverse. That just releases any kind of tension in the transmission because you basically where that, where that tension comes from is because we've got open diffs, um, the average speed of the front two wheels has to equal the average speed of the rear two wheels. Uh, that never happens. So your front and your rear prop shafts are sort of fighting each other. They're trying to rotate at different speeds because of that. Because when you go around a corner, every wheel takes a different line. The only way to get rid of that tension is either to be on a really slippy surface for one of the wheels to spin slightly and break traction, or just reverse back a little bit and that'll release the tension and the diff lock will engage, no problem at all. Okay, still can't hear the fan, but to keep going. fun if it was wet. Overheat red light on on the dash, so we know the top that the engine isn't too hot. But that fan should be coming on soon. It did take quite a while last time to uh, for us to get the overheat light on and for us to have the test light come on as well. This uh, it's running pretty cool, which is good. It's a good indication that everything's as it should be. That could be the fan. Let's pull up.
work proof, the fan's working as it should do, we're going to give it a full test. So there you go, we have checked the engine cooling system. We've got the engine up to operating temperature, we've been working it hard going around the paddock. And as the temperature's risen up, uh, the cooling fan has been triggered. And the cooling fan has operated really well, it's come straight on. It hasn't stayed on for very long, and then it's turned off again, which tells us it's, it's easily able to, to keep control and to modulate the, the coolant temperature on the engine. If the fan had come on and stayed on for ages, then we know that maybe there's still a bit of a problem going on and we need to look at that. Maybe there's an issue with coolant flow or whatever. But the fact it was only on for a short time and it cuts off, stays off for quite a while, then cuts back on for a short time, that's a really good indication that the, the fan is on top of the job. We've got plenty of cooling going on. We've tested the two-wheel drive system, the four-wheel drive system and the diff lock. We've tested the brakes on the vehicle. Really good. Very pleased with that. And we've also tested the parking brake. We had it facing downhill on about a 30 degree slope facing uphill on a 45 degree slope and it held the vehicle completely stationary. There was no element of slippage at all. If we tried to set off with the parking brake on, there was a heck of a resistance. It didn't want to go anywhere, which again tells me that that parking brake is really good. All in all, um, I'm very happy to sign this vehicle off and let the customer have it back. Very pleased with the job. Um, I hope you found all these particular tasks, workshop tasks that we've done on the Yamaha Viking helpful. If you do have any questions, then obviously leave a comment at the end of the video and I'll do my best to find out uh, whatever specs that you need. I have the workshop manual, so that's always useful. Um, so there we go, job done. Uh, my name is Andy Young. I'm one of the automotive lecturers down at Unitech in Auckland. And uh, I do these videos to help my students to see real world outside jobs, what really goes on and the kind of things that we have to fix as mechanics. I'm very fortunate, I'm a qualified car mechanic and a qualified motorcycle mechanic, so I've got a bit of an overlap there. And uh, also in New Zealand I can do uh, WAFs, that's Warranted Fitness, or what you would call an MOT in England, uh, and PDIs, which is pre-delivery inspections, I'm qualified to sign those off as well. So there's quite a wide spectrum of things that I can do, that I'm qualified to do, which means that I can take on lots of different kinds of jobs. And uh, I get to work on lots of different kinds of vehicles as a result of that. And that makes it really interesting, and I have lots of stories for my students. So anyway, hope you found it interesting. Cheers for watching. Over and out.